<laughs> prep to a uh, community college here in Ballarat. And that's a really diverse school. And um, Shay's been on quite a learning journey from training originally as a reading recovery teacher to then um, really fully embracing, because we've had some great conversations about it, fully embracing the more recent research into how children learn to read. And I think sometimes when you teach in that really diverse context, sometimes you have that bit more of a burning drive around literacy because your children don't always come in with those great things. Um, sometimes when they come into school, you know, less oral language, you know, less exposure to print, less background knowledge, and it really becomes um, the weight on the teacher a lot more to get those children across the bridge to literacy. So Shay's gonna share some of her experiences and what she's learned and maybe some um, tips and things if you're looking to head this way in your own school. From that big picture, and that's why we thought we'd start with Shay, we're going then to Laura, who's a um, two, three classroom teacher at um, Kamida. And I've only just learned how to say her school properly. And that's a smaller school just outside Bacchus Marsh. Um, and like most of us, Laura didn't learn the science of reading at university. And she explained to me, because I'm always really interested, interested as to how people get started. It was actually one of her son's teachers when she was volunteering in that classroom that kind of pointed her in that in this direction when she was in the classroom as a reading volunteer. So she's really going to focus on that reading comprehension strand of the reading rope, which is um, yeah, something really important for us to develop because we know our novice decoders, it's actually their decoding ability that is the greatest predictor of our novice readers of their reading. But as children become stronger readers, it's actually their language comprehension that becomes a better predictor of reading outcomes. So it's really important that we're developing that alongside our decoding. And then Alice is going to talk about the other strand of the reading rope and particularly around Alice as a classroom teacher here at Canadian Lead Primary School and also um, in implementing the tutor learning initiative at the moment particularly when that fluency strand doesn't happen, when that word recognition, when the phonics word recognition and fluency doesn't progress as we would normally hope over those first couple of years, what can we do as classroom teachers? So really diverse presentations and really exciting. And I'm hoping, um, and I always feel like reminding people too that Kathleen and I kind of do this as our little hobby on reads and apology as well. Reed, Reed couldn't be with us tonight after school and we've had some um, pretty famous technical glitches, but we've got our fingers crossed tonight that everything's gonna go really smoothly. Um, it's always a bit tricky moving between presenters too. So just keep that in mind. Um, we might have some tiny little breaks in between as we go from one to the other. But Kathleen, you're right to hand over to Shay. Awesome. Yes, take it away, Shay. Sure. Awesome, thanks Shay. Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Shay and as Sue said, my role today is to talk about our science of reading journey at Yule Park Community College where I'm a Prep 1-2 teacher and part of our literacy team. So Yule Park Community College is a P-8 school with three campuses. At the Grevillea campus we teach in pods which are open spaced areas with three home groups. Each home group in pod one has a mixture of preps, grade ones and grade twos. The students move around the pod for different lessons and work with different teachers throughout the day. We currently have 48 students working with three teachers, one tutor and four ES members, which may seem like overstaffing to the rest of you. However, we are in a very low socioeconomic area and have a high percentage of funded students. I currently have three students funded for severe language in my classroom. So we're in the process of moving from balanced literacy to structured literacy across the school. Before we started this process, we had more than 50% of our students below benchmark in teacher judgments for reading. So something had to change. A Little bit of background about me. I've always been a sounder outer. So when I was in prep, my mother found me out the front with a blackboard teaching another child how to spell the F word. She was distraught and demanded to know who had taught me how to spell. 
crying, I answered. I sounded it out. I got it right. Too. So I then completed, well, I completed a psychology undergraduate followed by a graduate diploma of teaching while I was home with my children, two of whom learned to read very easily, one who struggled. He was referred to reading recovery in grade one. And at that time I'd finished university and was feeling very ill-equipped to teach reading. I started reading recovery training where I would happily put up my hand to answer questions, but always felt that my answers were wrong. I was always encouraging my students to sound out the words and was very quickly told that was not what we do in read and recovery. I kept doing it anyway. I'm glad I did the training. I liked the pace and the setup of the lessons, but I just could not bring myself to promote guessing as a reading strategy. I then saw the grade three, four slump in my own child. The picture scaffolds were removed and he was lost needing more intervention. In 2019, I attended a learning difficulties workshop run by the education department with La Trobe University. Amina McLean was one of the presenters and I spent the whole day nodding and saying, yes, this is what I've been looking for. So these three quotes became my mantra. Following this, I read anything and everything I could find out about the science of reading. I started experimenting in my own classroom. I introduced phonological awareness into the lessons. I found all the old boxes of Fitzroy readers covered in dust and I brought them back into the classroom. And I was having regular discussions with our speech therapist at school about cute articulation. Most importantly, I started enrolling in courses and learning whatever I could. So these are some of the courses I did. So I started looking at SSP, which is Speech Sound Picks, a program that replaced phonetic symbols with monsters. And I know a lot of people are not fans of the program, but I credit Emma Lewis with most of my learning about the big six. I started using SSP in my classroom, but I struggled to get it through the school as others thought using the monsters was not age appropriate for the older students. I then looked into the SMART spelling program, took the course and we started teaching it across the school. It was a start with students being explicitly taught spelling. Letters training was next. Letters stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. It covers the what, why and how of literacy instruction. And I believe it's a course that every teacher in every school should do. We currently at Yule have six staff undertaking letters training now. Um, with all these courses, I won't go into too much detail about, but I'm happy for people to ask questions about how to find out more about them. So the next one, the next course I did was Sounds Right, which is a synthetic phonics program, which is run by the Dys Dyslexia Spelled Foundation. And we have all of our pod one teaching staff recently trained in Sounds Right and we're teaching that every day throughout pod one. The next course I took was the Writing Revolution. Um, Reed Smith and his colleagues at Clarendon College facilitated a group for Australian teachers to be able to access this learning. And I completed Advancing Thinking Through Writing Prep to Two over a six week period very early in the morning. And the most recent course I've taken is the Reading Teachers Top 10 Tools. It's a self-paced online course run by Dr. Deb Glaser in America, and you pay for it every month. It works out to be about $33 a month, but it provides access to lots of very good articles related to the science of reading and lots of videos of her teaching in the classroom. So what does literacy look like in my classroom? I start with a good book, usually a novel. Good quality novels and read alouds are a must. I read to my class a lot. I've just put three reading spines up there that I use a lot. We use Hegarty phonological awareness every day, taking between 12 and 15 minutes. And after this slide, there'll be a bit of a video of me using it in the classroom. It really has helped develop the, develop the ability of my students to hear the sounds in words. Following Hegarty, we have a sounds right lesson. And then we move to paired fluency reading, where I pair students up to read together. Some days we choral read a decodable passage and highlight the sound we're learning about. Other days we're practicing with decodable readers. 
Currently, we're using Fitzroy, Dandelion and Sounds Right Decodables. Following this, we all come together for a read, a read aloud from the core knowledge curriculum. I've been working my way through fables, fairy tales and stories. This curriculum is free to download and is packed with vocabulary and comprehension questions. The kids love it. I then use the core knowledge story for our writing instruction, where we construct a sentence together and I model the writing process using templates from the writing revolution. We also have smart spelling and handwriting instruction three days a week. I've got a little video here, which I'll just play about a minute of, but um, Amy and I were discussing our literacy leader, how peer observation has been a major part of our transformation. Teachers want to see how you teach your lessons before they're willing to go and try it in their own classrooms. And at Yule, we're very open to other people coming into our classrooms to learn and to learn from. So this will play straight away, but I'll move it on a bit. All right, what is it? I'm going to start those ones again. The K and the S don't go together. Show me again why. You tell me what it is. Sh, E, S. Make sure, remember we talked about those adjacent consonants? We need to make sure we don't mix them together and smush them together. They are their own sounds. Excellent. Which, are you ready? Each. Excellent. Thread. Excellent. Shine. Push fingers to show it. Wheels. There's another one. Say L. Say L but add sh at the start. Say erd. Say erd but add at the start. Cadence, keep going. Say air. Say air but add sh. Say ooze. Say ooze but add sh. Good. Say ash. Say ash and add Good. Say is. Or actually say is. Say is and add Good. Say unk. Say unk and add ch at the start. Say north. Say north, but don't say mm. Say charm. Say charm, but don't say ch. Say thirst. Say thirst, but don't say. Good. Say beach. Say beach, but don't say but. Good. Say. I won't play it forever. So yeah, we do that every day. Um, and it takes about 15 minutes, but the difference in the kids and what they can hear in their writing and when they're looking for sounds in their reading has, has been remarkable. You're right. Good. Okay, assessment is my next part of my talk. So in pod one, we're in the process of adapting our assessment schedule to match the differing approach to our teaching. In the past, we've solely used F and P and we're still using it, but only for students who have full mastery of their letters and sounds. I knew we were on the right track with the imp implementation of phonics, phonological awareness, decodables and so on, but I knew that we needed to change our assessment. The new assessment schedule needed to be effective, reliable, quick to administer and cheap. I once again started looking around other school assessments, asking questions online and looking at webinars. Then Amina McLean posted about implementing a literacy assessment schedule. Perfect timing again, Amina. Amina's blog is a favourite read of mine and I read her assessment post over and over again. I downloaded all of her assessments and though we have not implemented them across the school yet, I've begun, tri begun trialling them with my class. So I found Dibbles and Cubed to be very good and I'll just show you what Dibbles includes. So this is a, a grade one test and they are timed for one minute per section. So a grade one test using all of these would take four minutes. The first one is letter naming fluency, then nonsense word fluency, word reading fluency and oral reading fluency. Uh, I started doing it with my class and it's just so quick and very telling at what they can and can't do. Dibbles also gives you a score sheet to use which grades your kids so that you know which kids need tutoring, which kids need small group work in your class, which kids are on target and the blue at the top down here shows you which kids are excelling at, at, at any of the skills. Um, on Facebook last night I noticed that Spelled in South Australia are actually running a Dibbles course next week on Thursday and Friday of how to use the assessment so we've signed up for that. 
The next, the next bit of assessment is cubed. Now I've only used this with about 10 students so far and I have mucked it up because I got carried away with how well they were reading and let them keep going. I found this test really quick and easy to administer and it's got how-to videos online that you can watch before you use it. But the kids are actually given this part here and it tests how quickly they're reading it, their accuracy, their prosody, um, their vocab, their retail, and language complexity here. I haven't sort of, I've got to get used to that part. So both of these assessments are free to download online, so it's cheaper than cheap, um, and they're both very effective. Oops, I want to lead into this. We've also been using Letters Spelling Screener, which, is, which comes from the Letters course. Um, I just wanted to show you because we've been using it to narrow our teaching focus for each of our spelling groups. And I've got results here from the beginning of the year and last week for one of our students. So this was the beginning of the year. And this is the screener on the right that we used to assess it. As you can see, not great handwriting and lots of scribble. So I redid the assessment on him last week. And this is where he came out. The beauty of this is that I can see exactly where I want to go with him next. So he's fallen down with vowel teams, vowel R, controlled vowel R, sorry, and maybe with his trigraphs. He knows what they are, but he's not using them in his writing and his spelling. But this gives a really good indication of where to next for this boy in particular there. I've made a list of my go-to resources. Feel free to take a screenshot if you like and I'm happy to just send that to Kath afterwards. I'm sure most of you have read them or heard of all these people but if not there's definitely a lot of books and articles to get in there and have a read of or have a look at. So where to next for us at Yule? We're going to continue to reflect on and refine our teaching practice improve our assessment across the school and continue with our ongoing professional development. My biggest piece of advice when you're heading into the science of reading is just have a go. Don't wait to be perfect at, some, at something before you try it and be your most important student. And that's it from me. And I love that friends clip over there. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Shay, thank you so much. That was, um, yeah, so wonderful and very generous of you to share that. And I'll just say a few things while Laura just gets herself set up as we move from one to another. That worked technically very well. Well done, Kathleen, working away in the background there. Um, Shay, incredible. Um, I could tell that about you, that drive for your own professional learning, which has been amazing because I know a lot of that has happened in your own time and really um, pushing yourself there. Um, I loved hearing the kids use the language of learning, like they um, that meta language when you spoke to them about adjacent consonants. It's really powerful for kids to explain to them, um, use that language, how, how their own language works. Yeah, and I, I know there'll be lots of people listening but there'll be lots of comments and um, questions coming in. Yeah, thank you so much. So Laura, you right to go? Looks, looks like you. Just checking that you're unmuted. Yeah. I just, there we go. I unmuted and then muted again. There yeah. we go. All right, Can, um, is, does thanks. that look all right from your end? Yep, looks fantastic. Thanks so much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Sue and Kathleen, and also big thank you to Shay. I think, um, Shay, you and I have a, a, so many similarities in the way that we're um, both approaching our teaching um, in the classroom, and it's really great to see. Uh, so thank you everybody for having me and uh, I'll be talking about how I implement the language comprehension strand of the reading rope. So specifically focusing on the vocabulary and comprehension and sentence level work in my year one, two class.
Uh, so to introduce myself, I graduated in mid-2019 and I currently work at Kamida Primary School and I've been there since 2020, so I had six months of CRT to begin with. Uh, I have a year one, two class and last year I had a year one, two class as well, so my um, twos have looped through with me, which has been really nice to see their growth um, over like the 18 months that I've had them now, which has been really nice. Uh, within my time at Kamida, I've been implementing structured literacy. So uh, in my classroom, we teach with systematic synthetic phonics. Um, I have been using decodable readers. Uh, we have recently purchased um, a wonderful set from uh, Decodable Readers Australia and their assessment kit as well, which just arrived yesterday. So I'm very excited to unwrap all the plastic off that one and get into it. Um, however, today my focus is not going to be on that word recognition strand, really the, that bottom strand of the reading rope. Um, while I do those lessons, my focus today is going to be on how I teach the, um, the top strand of the reading rope, so the language comprehension strand. So what I do to teach um, my shared reading and writing lessons, I pick a different author each term. And from that author, I choose about seven to nine books and I have a book each week. So we have a book of the week and that book takes us through three one hour lessons per week. And through those lessons, we have a big focus on the vocabulary, building the vocabulary um, that's in those books and um, comprehension and sentence level writing there. So how do I select the text? Um, it's lots of fun to select those beautiful texts. This is just like Shay said, is where we get that opportunity to use rich literature. I think that structured literacy teachers often get a bit of a, a reputation of only using decodable readers and killing that joy of reading, which I think is absolutely not true. Um, it's that one of those misnomers, um, but this is where we get that opportunity to select those beautiful books and um, the ones that stretch our students beyond what they could read alone. I also like to choose books that have a, a good message from the author, like being kind or respecting our planet or showing bravery, which can really lead to some deep discussions and beautiful discussions within the classroom. Um, I choose text from the same author because I believe that it encourages that text to, to text connection. So, for example, I did Julia Donaldson one term and um, in The Snail and the Whale is a character that draws a picture of the Gruffalo. And it's not really mentioned, but it's these little Easter eggs that the kids pick up and they notice and they, they say, well, that's like that. Um, and it just happens naturally. Also in... Um, uh, a bus called Heaven, Stella in a bus called Heaven saves the bus just like Will saves the bird in How to Heal a Broken Wing when we were um, looking at Bob Graham as our author of the term there. I also like to try to consider um, the five plagues of the developing reader as Doug Lamov discussed in his book Reading Reconsidered. Uh, so those five plagues, we have the archaic language, so that's found in books published at least 50 years ago. I haven't actually used these books in my shared reading and writing lessons as yet. I might go into it a bit further on down the track, but I do use those type of books during my dear time where I just read to the children just for enjoyment and we talk about the um, vocabulary that comes up there. Um, the next one is the non-linear time sequence. So, um, for example, in Silver Buttons, uh, which is a Bob Graham book, everything happens in the same minute. So it's not just this, then this, then this. So it's a different kind of time sequence that what children might be used to in what they normally read. Um, also, the a narratively complex text. So um, things that might have multiple narrators or um, uh, multiple plot lines going on at the same time as well. And the fourth one is figurative or symbolic texts. So, for example, um, in The Heart and the Bottle, which I'll, um, I've created a PowerPoint for, I'll be using later on in the year, um, the, the protagonist takes her heart out and actually puts it into a bottle. So we'll be talking about what that really means. 
And um, the great res resource there is the Five Plagues of Reading Spine, which um, Shay had put up as well on her slide. So um, that's the through the Teach Like a Champion uh, website. Uh, and it's got all of uh, a selection of texts for each reading level um, according to those five plagues. So that's where I start off and get some ideas from. And then I think, well, OK, so if there's that author there, then I might look at some other books from other authors uh, from from that same author and um, see if they've you know got a nice big uh, selection of books that I can use for the whole term. Okay, moving on to vocabulary, the what and the when. So teaching vocabulary, uh, we know to teach that tier two vocabulary, which is language found in written texts rather than our regular playground language, our oral language, and it crosses a range of contexts. Um, I do teach the specific tier three language more through my inquiry and HASS lessons. Um, I tend to select more of the tier two in these literature lessons instead. Um, if there's a few different um, possibilities of words that I could select, I try to think of which ones have got the most usability. Um, if there's one that doesn't have uh, an easy synonym, so for example, if there was the word enormous, I could just quickly say during the reading, we know that means really, really big. Um, also, if there's a, a word that's easily understood from the context, um, perhaps maybe through the illustrations or just through um, the context of the text, um, we might discuss that in the text, uh, in the reading of the text, rather than pre-teaching it. So that might not be one of the, the uh, words that I select. Um, I try to select three to four uh, words per book. I would like to do more, um, but I'd rather do three to four well than to rush through five or six or seven and not really have the children remember what those words mean and not know them deeply. So when do I introduce them? So um, I do uh, introduce the vocabulary, vocabulary words before we read the text. Um, although you could do it after. Uh, I know in a, um, a PD that I did with Amina uh, on her vocabulary teaching, she says uh, she does it after reading the text, um, but she said you can do it either as well. But I do it before because it helps the comprehension of the text and also it keeps the kids listening out for those words because I tell them to put their hands on their head when they hear the word. We also review those words before the second read and we review them again before the third lesson. I do, don't do a third read because then it leaves us a bit more time for writing. And then I review it again in our daily reviews. So the next week and then through the next term as well. And how do I do it? So this is an example slide. Uh, so a slide like this will come up um, for uh, the students to have a look at and it has the words with the sound buttons. Um, and the sound bars as well, if it's a digraph or a trigraph. And we say the word and we'll split it into its phonemes. And uh, then we have the student friendly definition underneath. That's really important, I think, to make sure that in your definition, you're not um, using words that are more complicated than the word you're trying to explain. Then I have a visual here and then example sentences in different contexts. So the first sentence, the chef made a very creative meal, obviously uh, relates to the visual. And then the second one uh, is from the text that we're reading. So this is from the day the crayons quit, where Duncan got a gold star for creativity. And um, it's uh, important, I think, to change up the visuals and change up the um, sentence, the context sentences as well because um, I remember when I didn't do that, I had a student that thought that frantic meant when you were lost in the supermarket. So we have to make sure that we use a few different examples. And I've also got the word family uh, up the top there. So um, lots of different ways that we can use that base word. So how I actually do it is I'll say the word, the students repeat the word. I'll give the definition, the students repeat the definition. Then I'll give the context sentences and um, I'll use the word family as well. So I might say, I like to create things. 
Billy creates things as well. Yesterday we created something in art. Uh, Susie is a creator. We all love creating and we show great creativity. So what word means having new ideas and using your imagination? Then the students will say creative. Then how I do it moving on, students uh, will then tell me the word. So in the second, um, the second lesson, I just put up that slide and say, what's this word? And they say what the word is, then they tell their partner what it means. And I'll share a couple of um, examples, uh, like a couple of different students will share their idea of what it means. Um, as I said before, using different images in the context sentences each lesson so that we're really um, expanding the depth of understanding of those words. Then we'll use the words in writing as well in their sentences. And we've got the daily reviews um, down the bottom too. So this is an example of a slide that I might put into my daily review. So which picture shows fussy, example and non-example. Also semantic maps. So for example, which words go with fussy or making a personal connection, like when have you been fussy or uh, do you think it's good to be fussy? And moving on to the comprehension side of things, I think the most important thing is to work text to strategy and not strategy to text. I see so many things on teachers pay teachers about, you know, how to teach the main idea or how to teach making inferences. And I think what we really need to do is just work with a text and how do we best understand that text. So before reading, I'll pre-teach the vocabulary and we might make a prediction about what the book might be about, but I don't spend a lot of time on that because it hasn't really been shown to have a lot of effect on comprehension. Then during reading, um, we'll go through that incidental vocabulary teaching. So those words that have a quick synonym or where we can use the context to decipher the meaning. And I'll also ask a question or two um, to monitor the comprehension, like what just happened there. Then after reading is where we have a really great conversation with the class. Um, I'll ask sequencing questions like what happened first, what happened after that, and cause and effect questions like what made that happen, and inferential questions like why did the character do that, or how does the author hint that this had happened. Uh, then structural questions like who was the main character and what was the problem and how is it solved, um, and getting the students to make their connections like what animals would you like to see in Africa or how does this character remind you of that character. Then at the end I always end with the same two questions which are do you like this story and why or why not and what do you think the author wanted you to know and my students expect these questions and they're all always therefore thinking about what the author's message is. So they're always ready at the end oh I think the author wanted me to know this. I'll accept all responses to do you like this story as long as it's backed up with their, with some evidence. Um, with the author's message, some students might see a superficial message. For example, um, in the book Eating Boy, one of the students said, uh, the author is trying to tell us that if you eat books, you'll get sick, which might be fair enough. Um, or in uh, The Cranky Bear, don't wake up someone if they're asleep. But other students might get a little bit deeper like it's really important not to judge people before you get to know them or even if you're small you can get out of tricky situations if you're clever and there's some actual examples from my students which has been really nice to to get them thinking a bit more deeply about um, the messages that can be in um, the books that we read. Then at the end of the uh, the lesson where we read the, the story to begin with, um, I'd like to do a comprehension activity. So it's not just read and talk, reading and talking and doing something as well. So it might be um, unscrambling a sentence and then drawing the sentence. So I'll have it cut out on a slip of paper and then they stick it in their books in the right order and then draw um, what that sentence says. Or we do lots of story summaries like the example here. Uh, or could be um, doing a like a Venn diagram comparing characters or um, drawing the different characters. And then we get into the sentence work. So this is where I use the writing revolution. 
activities um, to write to teach the students to write really strong sentences. Firstly, at uh, the beginning of the year, we spend a lot of time teaching what a sentence is and that it has a subject and a verb. Then we identify sentences versus fragments and turn the fragments into sentences. So we've spent the whole of semester one on identifying subjects and verbs and my kids have really mastered it now. We've also identified adverbs and adjectives, but when I talk about it, I don't say uh, jump is a verb or slowly is an adverb. I talk about um, I talk about it by saying what part tells us when or what part tells us what it is like. So having that focus more on uh, words or parts of sentences have jobs rather than um, that they are a noun or they are a verb. And we've covered different sentence types as well. So statement, command, question and exclamation, both identifying them and creating them as well. Of course, I teach the famous because, but, so from the writing revolution. And I also include and as well, because I do them in pairs when I introduce them first. So I pair and with but. So we've got and um, is something that goes along with um, the first part of the sentence and but will be something that shows something different. And I pair because and so. So because showing what came before and so showing what comes after. Uh, so that's those, those contrasting functions. And we do uh, both joining sentence activities and also completing the STEM activities. Recently, I've been working on run-on sentences as well. I've introduced the concept of a clause, um, which has been not too difficult to understand because we were talking about sentences have a subject and a verb. So clauses also have a subject and a verb. And um, because my kids have been identifying those in their sentences, they can identify what a clause is and they're equipped to fix those run-ons without too much trouble. So tips for doing your sentence work. I like to only introduce one concept at a time. So um, I have a single focus for a grammar lesson. For example, I'll just introduce the when adverb separately to a how adverb rather than going, these are all the adverbs. So we would look at what tells us when and everything's just about when. Uh, and then the next lesson might be uh, what uh, part of the sentence tells us how and we're looking at how adverbs and we're creating sentences, including how adverbs. Um, as I said before, that focusing on the parts of a text have functions rather than um, this is a noun, this is an adjective. Always using examples from the text. Uh, if we can use the examples from the text that we're reading in our sentence work, then it improves the comprehension of the text and using the vocabulary words will improve the understanding of um, the vocabulary as well. So my next big focus is really moving students from copying off the board to generating their own text. We've all got students with different levels. Um, some of my students were just looking at first sounds and identifying the first sound. Some students were looking at sounding out words and some students were writing sentences or perhaps multiple sentences. Uh, and I did a great PD with Jocelyn Seema who taught me to identify where the students were, meet them at their level and move them forward at that level or to their next level, moving everybody forward together. And to do that, I model writing at each level where they're at. So I might model just writing the first sounds of, um, of the words that I'm thinking of. So I'll have a picture up on the board from our text and some questions like, what's going on in this picture? What do you see? And because we've read the text, they've got an idea of what's happening. So some students might just go uh, dragon and they might go, D -d -d that's a D and they'll write the D. And so um, so I'll be modeling that as well. So we might say, yeah, there's a rock. What does rock start with? It starts with er. Um, but then I will also model writing whole words, like the character there is zog, let's sound out zog, zog, and writing that down. And also modeling uh, zog is proud because he has a gold star. And this is some examples of my students' work at those three different levels.
So as you can see, the first one is just identifying the first sounds, but she's thinking of lots of different things in that picture of super, super worm. And um, then I'm just with her uh, writing out the rest of the words so that we can remember what she's been writing about. The middle one there, the bug is on a rock. Uh, at the start of the year, that student was not able to write any CVC words, had very little um, uh, a very little ability to um, to sound out any words at all. And then one of my higher students uh, being able to write a complex sentence there. So they're all doing the exact same activity, but all at their own level. And this is another example of some fantastic progress of one of my students who is a different student who also started the year having no uh, phoneme grapheme correspondences at all. It was just uh, writing a string of letters. And now, as you can see, she's really sounding out those words and writing multiple sentences. Not perfect, but the progress has been really fantastic. My next steps now that I've started doing this is um, our oral retail. So um, I've used the cubed assessment, just like Shay mentioned, I've used the cubed assessment for listening comprehension. And I found that our skills in oral retail really remained low. Uh, so I wanted to up our game and I started doing oral retails in class. So these icons are the same icons as from the cubed assessment. Um, which is from the language dynamics group and I've created just these little story strips and I've laminated them and the students can hold them in their hand while they're retelling the story. It's early days but having these icons reminds them of the, the story grammar that they need to include and so I'm hoping that towards the end of the year when we reassess using the cubed that their scores are really going to go up. We've got the one episode example there, for example, like Tiddler, where um, he gets lost. That's his one problem. And then he finds his way home. Um, and the two episode, like, for example, in the Gruffalo. So the first um, problem is that uh, the mouse is getting eaten or wants to. All the animals want to eat the mouse and how he gets out of that trouble. And then the second problem is when he meets the Gruffalo and how he gets out of that trouble with the Gruffalo as well. So the um, in the cubed assessment, the grade two level is with a two episode story and the grade one level is with a one episode story. So it's good to have a bit of both. And then linking in with that, we've been starting to write our own stories now. So we can do our story summary using this um, cubed um, icon uh, outline the a graphic organizer and once we've done a lot of examples of um, story summaries of the stories we've been reading we can use these to create our own stories and I've just started that uh, I started it just before we went to remote learning so my kids have got their plans and they've started writing their plans out into sentences and it's I think it's getting really exciting where they're going creating their own stories. Um, so I'm yeah, hope, very much crossing my fingers to get back into the classroom and we can get our plans back out and continue writing our amazing narratives. So I just want to say a big thank you to uh, my inspiration, so Nancy Hennessy for the Reading Comprehension Blueprint and uh, Judith and Natalie from The Writing Revolution and the amazing William Van Cleve. Um, I did his Syntax Matters uh, webinar and that was so inspirational. Jocelyn Seema teaches me so much all the time and also our favourite Reading Science in Schools Facebook group which I'm on constantly. And that's it from me. Awesome Laura, thank you so much. Um, that's so exciting and I think lots of thank yous for both Shay and Laura coming in in the chat. I'll, I'll just say a couple of things while Kathleen gets Alice set up. Um, Something to acknowledge is that our people in the audience here tonight, all at different stages on our learning about teaching, reading and literacy. So um, both Laura and Shay, you know, were dropping names in there and sometimes um, terms that other people would be really familiar with, um, like talking, I think, um, Laura, you mentioned the five plagues. Some people would be really familiar with that and who Doug Lamov is and others that would be new learning. So don't be, you know, put off by that. And also that that, you know, the learning that 
both Laura and Shay have done has come over quite a long period of time and we've all got to start somewhere and we all just start where we are and certainly people that I've partnered with on this sort of learning journey you know one thing leads to another um, and there's there's lots of things I'm hearing here that sort of give Kathleen and Reid and I a good idea of where to next and certainly assessment is something that does come up with people once you change a few aspects of the way you teach it has a huge impact on your assessment schedule. So um, just so much crammed into those 15 minutes, super exciting. So Laura took, I'm glad you showed that visual of the reading rope, um, Laura, there, because that is a very important thing for, I think, schools to have some sort of model like that where we agree on what those skills are and what we're all working on at different stages of our you know, novice to expert readers. So Laura was talking about the reading comprehension strand. Alice is going to much more focus on that um, word recognition and fluency strand, and particularly what we can do when it doesn't go well for students. So Alice, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Hard act to follow after those two, yeah. um, but I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to talk this afternoon, as Sue just said, about um, our response to intervention at Canadian Lead Primary School, um, particularly tier two intervention. Um, and by no means is this the perfect model, um, but it is what we have done this year. And I just hope that um, we can show you how we've supported our most vulnerable students at our school this year. Um, so this year I've taken a tier two approach to intervention in both literacy and numeracy, um, but this afternoon I'll just present um, the first cohort of literacy. So, oh, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, for those of you who don't know, the response to intervention looks a little like this, um, and it's that multi-tiered approach that enables us to teach students um, and to identify those who are vulnerable. So in T1 is that quality core classroom instruction and ensuring that we're getting that right before we start to take students out for tier two. Um, so if students are not making the progress that they should be, um, then tier two is that targeted small group instruction, which I'm going to talk a lot about um, this afternoon. And then of course, if tier two instruction instruction isn't working in that small group, um, then it moves on to tier three, which is that intensive individual intervention or in maybe a pair that are like abilities. So um, our goal in 2020 at Canadian Lead was to get tier one classroom teaching instruction right. And we knew that this quality instruction had to happen before we focused on withdrawing students from the classroom. Staff were trained in Sounds Right, The Writing Revolution, Peggy Lego Handwriting and Talk for Writing. And this ensured that the teachers were delivering evidence-based strategies and instruction at a whole class level, um, particularly in those grades foundation to year two last year. Um, and then by getting that classroom one instruction right, we hope that in the future, this will limit those students needing tier two and tier three intervention. So my intervention journey began without me really knowing um, in term four last year, when I started to take a tier two approach in my classroom with a group of seven students who were 12 months or more below in reading. These students could not decode and therefore had a really negative view on reading. Remote learning hadn't helped this situation and I felt a real sense of urgency to teach and support these vulnerable students in the classroom. Uh, these students had been taught the initial code and had just began um, the extended code. So back in term four last year, it looked a little bit like this in the classroom. Um, I made sure that I'd planned high quality evidence-based instruction for the students at and above level so that I was able to then take a focus group every day to work with those most vulnerable students. I started by implementing a double dose of sounds right, reading decodable books and completing a dictation every day with this group of seven students. I started seeing some really positive results, particularly with the lowest readers but I wasn't collecting regular evidence in the way of progress checks, and it was purely just my observations um, and student work samples. So reflecting now um, from what I've learned this year, I would have a much clearer identification process and screening assessments, and I'd also have weekly progress checks rather than just my observations. So the tutoring funding um, gave us the perfect opportunity to continue this tier two approach and implement a targeted program for 2021. There was a real sense of urgency at our school and we had a significant number of students below the expected level in reading at the end of 2020. 
particularly in the middle years. Um, we had many conversations as leadership um, as to you know, where the research shows that it takes a lot more resources and time to catch students up beyond grade two, but we made the decision as a school to choose students from years three and four for our first intervention cycle. This decision was made because I had been in the one, two unit as a classroom teacher and had informally began the intervention process with some of these students. I'd formed positive relationships with them and knew exactly where, where they were in their learning. Um, so I was able to start intervention on day two of 2021. Due to a significant amount of time spent in remote learning in 2020, we were also unsure and hopeful that the students um, who were below in foundation and grade one would make significant growth by simply being back on site and engaged in good quality tier one instruction. Our plan was to then pick up those vulnerable students mid-year, um, which we have done now. So we chose students based off the curriculum scores at the end of the year who had similar learning needs. So these students couldn't decode, um, couldn't blend and segment, and were all at similar stages of the Sounds Right program. 11 students were identified from the middle unit cohort with similar learning needs. Um, and from those 11 students, we formed two groups, one group that was significantly lower who were beginning readers, and the other group could re read, but not decoding quick enough to comprehend. Um, students, these students would engage in a sounds right lesson in their classroom um, and then would be withdrawn from their literacy block for a 45 minute intervention session um, that, yeah, I'm going to talk through in a moment. So they all engaged in sounds right with their classroom teacher and then came out for a 45 minute block. Oop. Um, so we decided to use um, progress checks from the Multilit program. Um, so we used the WARP, which tests the reading or reading um, fluency. So uh, as you can see in the yellow there, at the start of the year in term one, a grade three student should be reading 86 words per minute on average, um, in term a grade four, 107. So 10 of our students were in that body, bottom 25%. Um, and they had these passages had unfamiliar, untaught code um, that, that we hadn't taught them in Sounds Right. It was presented, I um, photocopied onto an A3 page. It was a full page of writing in full paragraphs and something that these students were really not used to um, and could not read. Um, but we persisted and this was collected fortnightly originally. Um, but Sue and I have been learning along the way and now realize it should be collected weekly. So we have started um, doing that as well. So here's the data. So down um, the side, we have the 11 students. Student K is the only grade four student. So you can see student A um, for their first check was reading five words per minute and the average is 86. Um, so those highlighted in green are the significantly lower um, students. They were grouped in the first group of intervention and then the others um, we grouped together as they were reading a little bit quickly, <laughs> um, but still not reading at that average. So that's the scores where we started. Um, I really wanted to track their spelling progress and their encoding skills as well, but I couldn't find any progress checks suitable at the time. So I decided to create my own um, spelling test using words from the Sounds Right program. I chose words across several units of the extended code that I knew I would be teaching um, over that 13 week intervention period. I created two different tests to ensure that there wasn't a testing effect. So test one, which you can see there, progress check one, um, that had 17 words and test two had 16 words. Um, the tests are there on the screen and these tests ensured that I was able to monitor students' encoding skills and recall of the spellings that had been taught through Sounds Right. Um, students were tested on their high frequency words each fortnight as well, and this came straight from our ICANN statements at school. Um, so an interve intervention session actually looked a little bit like this. So we had the first 15 minutes was um, a spelling program, program one. Um, 10 minutes was spelling program two. Four minutes we spent on high frequency words. Eight minutes was a writing component, component and eight minutes was a reading component. This changed, um, this is how it initially looked. This changed a lot of times over that first six month period. But that's to give you an indication. Um, so the first spelling program was Sounds Right. So students had already had a Sounds Right lesson in their classroom that was 
half an hour long. Um, so we made that decision to shorten this to try and fit a lot in that 45 minutes, um, but still went through each of the codes. So I worked alongside the middle unit teachers um, and we planned that. So that whole time still ensured that there was three sessions included um, in a sounds right lesson. And for those of you who have done the training, that would make sense. Um, making sure that I was doing error corrections and handwriting corrections um, the whole time, roaming, um, and that happened five days a week. Then the second part of the spelling component was spelling mastery. So um, we felt that we needed to keep students in touch with programs that were occurring in the middle unit classrooms and that they were being withdrawn from and we knew that they'd go back to in time. So um, middle unit teachers were taking spelling mastery lessons and we did not want students to go back after 13 or 14 weeks not having any clue and just jumping into a lesson at number 39. Um, so we made that decision as a school and I just looked through each lesson and found, you know, some of the most important parts that I thought um, for that 10 minutes and made sure that I implemented those with fidelity. So I did that four times a week as well um, because the middle unit teachers were implementing it four times a week. So just keeping consistency there. Um, roaming, making error correct corrections, um, ensuring letter formation was correct and that high quality handwriting. I did find it really difficult at the start because sometimes I hadn't taught some of the spelling patterns with sounds right. I was teaching it alongside, um, but I, it was so worthwhile and I could see dramatic improvements as well. Um, it's also been seamless now looking back for those students entering back into the classroom after intervention um, and they, they know what they're doing. You can slip straight back into it. Um, another approach taken directly from the letters course, which I know Shay spoke about, um, was the transfer to text process. So the purpose of this process, um, oh sorry, not this one, I'm on the wrong one. Um, this was from the letters course as well, but this was from Sue, our principal and Deanne, literacy leader. Um, they, they are currently doing the letters course and we're coming back and giving me so many strategies. So I was reaping um, the flow on effect of their professional development, which was awesome. Um, but this was just a little activity um, that Deanne came back and said to me one day for high frequency words, say the word three times, spell it three times, write it three times. So we did that for the first six to seven weeks. Um, and after about seven weeks, nearly all of those students could read and write those words independently. Um, and just something little, we purchased um, dotted third whiteboards, which were really, really valuable. Um, because it meant that although we were explicitly teaching handwriting, we could incidentally just make those error corrections through those three spelling programs. Um, so I'd highly recommend doing that. And the Teachables ones are very good. Um, then there was an eight minute writing component, um, which included lots of the writing revolution, um, things that both the ladies have spoken about tonight. So I won't go through all of those, um, but we did do eight minutes of writing every day. And then on Fridays, there was a funny Friday sentence, um, which was just a bit of fun, uh, a dictation sentence that was code that they'd already learned. So it was purely revision that I would just make up and then they would um, check their words and we'd go back, correct it. And then they got to look at the funny um, picture, which was fun. That was an idea from Sue. Um, then after that, oh, there's some pictures there. We did um, some decodable character writing, sentence scrambles, um, looking at nouns, etc. So this is the other approach from the letters course, which is called the transfer to text process. So this process um, is for students to highlight a targeted spelling pattern. So for example, in this planning, they were highlighting um, I, the sound. So students practice reading those words in isolation before reading them in a sentence. Students then practice reading a clean copy of that text. And over the week, they'd practice this every day and read three different texts by the Friday, which all had the I sound in them, um, for example. So this reading element of the lesson was a non-negotiable and it happened every single day. We started using timers to time how many words um, the student could read per minute. And most times they'd improved over the week um, as they were practicing the same target spelling. Students began to feel really self-motivated and enjoyed seeing their progress over the week. So um, refining my practice for the first six months, I was constantly refining and making adjustments for that tier two intervention session. And I still am. Um, I had Kathleen Williams come in and do a peer observation and some feedback and just slowing down the pace of the lesson, ensuring um, because it was 45 minutes and a lot to cram in, 
um, ensuring that students were learning the new content and having the opportunity to practice new skills. Um, student feedback was really important and I had a visible um, individualised goal wall and it was working really well. So the students were then becoming self-motivated and driving their learning by rubbing out their goals um, when they'd achieved them and by asking to put new ones up. So that was really good. So here is some of the data. Um, so I'll show you the spreadsheet in a moment, but we're in term three now. Um, for some of the students that have entered back into the classroom, we are still tracking their progress um, using the WARP. Uh, so term three, a grade three should be reading 93 words and a grade four 121 on average. Um, so I'll just explain the table. This is student A who started on five. Green indicates growth um, from their last progress check. Red is a decline and if there's yellow it means that it was the same. The orange is for me um, because the orange is that was done just this week so it was via the computer so it wasn't implemented the same as all the other progress checks have been. Um, but you can see that this student started at five, went up to nine, seven, 14, 17, had a really big jump to 60. I remember running into Sue's room nearly in tears, so excited, but us both thinking it could have been a fluke. Um, so for us to see that, you know, they were able to hold sort of those words was really, really pleasing. Um, and then, yeah, just the other day, read 91 words per minute on the screen. So that was very exciting. Um, so here is the data of the 11 students that were first identified. Um, two students have left since then. So they were there um, only for the first few progress checks. Um, you can see, yeah, if you have a little look there, lots of green, lots of red too, um, some yellow. Uh, the end column is their final progress check. I haven't done all of them um, remotely this week, so I didn't include all of them on there. Um, but you can see that majority of them are now sitting sort of in that higher end, edging closer to 93, some very close to 93. Um, the two with the two arrows are two students who Sue and I have had many conversations that maybe tier three intervention is where they need now um, because what we're doing isn't quite working for them. So they might need that intensive one-on-one -on -one work um, because their numbers, knowing that student K is a grade four as well, isn't quite where we want them to be. But the tier two approach for those other students um, has been working and will continue to work. Um, just looking at the handwriting as well, explicitly teaching that at the start of the year, but then just making sure that, um, you know, we have that high expectation through every lesson. Um, the handwriting has improved out of sight. Um, so my learning so far is teaching with fidelity. So the Sounds Right program and Spelling Mastery, not trying to put your own spin on it. It is what it is. Just read from the script and it will work. Uh, making those evidence informed decisions, providing students with specific and achievable goals um, and they'll become self-motivated. Progress monitoring is so important and about having those chosen from the very start. Um, no excuses, students can and will learn. Thinking flexibly with an open mind and always thinking how can I do better for these students and that every minute of that 45 minute lesson is teaching time and it's so valuable. Um, and to have that leadership support, not once have I been used as a CRT, if someone's sick, um, you know, at our school we value intervention and it's a priority and that's why I think we are getting these positive results. So where to next? There's lots of things, but I just chose a few, but looking um, sort of at delving a bit deeper into that tier three intervention now for those two students, um, and I'm sure we've got more in our school, that's just the first two, um, that just need that more intensity. Um, using the knowledge, this knowledge that I've learned to support teachers in the classroom um, to drive their own tier two intervention, um, as well as monitoring those students who have entered back into the classroom now. Um, just refining my practice and ensuring what I'm teaching is transferring to long-term memory. Uh, I would love to explore progress monitoring checks for encoding, and I know Shay sent me some a couple of day, a days ago, so I want to have a look at those um, rather than just creating my own spelling tests and just continuing to learn and improve my practice in Tier 2 um, interventions for particularly students in that 1-2 year level as well. But that is all from me. So thank you for listening on a Thursday afternoon after everyone's been in front of the screen. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. I think probably everyone's a little bit like me listening, thinking we could have had all of those three presenters do a whole hour just on their own because that was 
that was a really fly through kind of version from um, everyone. And, but I think, yeah, what, what we wanted to do was highlight some of the amazing practices that we know are happening in our local community. And um, yeah, just build that sort of understanding of what we believe is really high quality literacy practices and particularly reading, but we know there's that great link between um, reading and writing, of course, it's really reciprocal. And um, yeah, three really different presentations, Shay with that big, you know, big picture, and then Laura very much around that reading comprehension. And I think if you can imagine if that's happening, plus, plus that great tier one teaching in a classroom with phonics, then the support to get kids decoding, you know, that idea of truly aiming to have, you know, realistically 95% of our children leaving primary school literate because we know if they don't, they are really locked out of that secondary school curriculum. Um, yeah, they just are. So really inspiring from the three of you. And I was kind of listening so hard, I wasn't uh, really looking at the questions. So let me just have a quick look. And if anyone, um, while well, I just skim through those, if anyone wanted to either put their hand up or maybe just even wave and unmute themselves to ask a quick question. We've gone over time, which I knew we would, but I'll just skim through here. Someone's going to sounds, a Sounds Right webinar. That's quite um, topical given um, the teachers. While you're skimming, Sue. Yep. yep. Um, someone, um, so Louise had a question, I think it was for Shay, around using the Hegarty test for phonological awareness, if you use that. So we actually have been playing around with the past test, the um, Kilpatrick's phonological assessment test screener. Um, our tutor and I sort of sat down with a lot of our kids and went through that and, and sort of really targeted where the kids were falling down. And we found that it was a lot on the middle, the middle sound of words. So I often slip in those one minute activities with the kids, you know, say dad change at to it because they were really bad at that and I know Melissa our tutor is working really hard on those one minute activities in her tutoring sessions as well so I haven't used the Hegarty screening yet but I found the past was really good so um Charlotte asked a question in the chat here can I ask about retention of knowledge over time and that's a great Charlotte I'm not even sure if you're on the screen and listening because I can't say oh there you are waving at me um Charlotte we talk about that a little bit that assessment can, on that one day can be performance rather than learning and true learning is long-term knowledge so that that is a great question um into, did you mean that fluency, that, that number of, is that what you meant, particularly around Alice and fluency? Because I, well, I think Alice might be having a little bit of trouble with the screen. She just messaged um, me. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I mean, my background is intervention. So I'm just curious about, um, and I work at Colac Specialist School, so we deal with kids with disabilities all sure. the time. So yeah. I guess in terms of the data, um, yes. you know, kids, can perform and then one week later, two weeks later, you know, yes. that long term memory stuff. Yes. So, I, I like the results are really good. And I think that program, that intervention program was fantastic, like the way yep. it was set out. Yep. But just curious about how that works, like in six months' time and yes. with their prior knowledge that they had, are they building on that prior knowledge and whether um, that knowledge will be retained and what is actually retained? Yes. So, I guess that's just. That's where I would go next is, I guess, but I'm just curious about- Yeah, great. It's a great wondering. Yeah. And probably Alice and I are a bit um, learning as we're going, because our goal this year was to set up a, an intervention model, because we will always have students who need that extra support. And, and once you've got tier one right, what does that look like? So you're consistent every year. So you've got consistent screening for the kids who come in and consistent monitoring. And you're exactly right. When they go back to the classroom, because um, our initial plan was to um, move to a different cohort of students mid-year and Alice wouldn't let them go, those kids, because they were, because they are so vulnerable, um, you know, they haven't caught up. And so we decided not yet. So we, we just had to sort of learn as we went, because we know that if they go back into the classroom into, you know, in amongst 20 or 23 kids, it is that harder to 
um, keep an eye on them. And if that had worked for them, they wouldn't be behind. If if that tier one had worked for them, they wouldn't be behind. But that's a great and um, using those progress checks that were through the multi lit um, organisation. That's the first time we've used them, and we have found them really. Uh, I think Alice might be able to speak, but I think are they only a minute, Alice? It's words per minute. You only read for a minute, so they're quick. Yeah. And that's a consistency, Shay, and both um, Laura too talking about assessments. I think all of us are trying to move towards assessments that don't take up teaching time. How often have we been in schools where we see that assessment for reporting start earlier and earlier and impact on that golden teaching time? We only have these kids, you know, for 40 weeks a year, two hour literacy block. Every single minute of that is important and we want our assessment to be quick and, you know, accurate and usable. Um, and they do have, um, sorry, jumping in yes. the word lists as well, which are for grades um, prep one, two, which are really good. And they're just one minute as well. Yes. So that's a different, it's not connected text. The progress checks yeah. for the one, twos. Yeah. Um, uh, leaving the program when they hit the goals. Um, Alice, do you want to talk to that just quickly? We, we have had trouble um, moving kids on out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess they were so far below that none of them caught up in those 13 weeks so we decided that mid-year we wouldn't just pop them back straight back in um but probably after um the last couple of weeks i guess remote learning's you know throwing a spanner in the works but there are some that are certainly ready um and i think are probably getting a little bit bored the gaps getting wider there are still a significant um lot that are below but there is certainly probably a group of six that are ready to go back and be exposed to that you know higher level thinking yeah and then some sort of plan for ongoing monitoring not just assessment at reporting time um yeah you know it might be every two or yeah maybe it's every three weeks or something to make sure mm -hmm. um yeah to make sure we're really keeping an eye on those children and i think that's where we need to look at our assessment schedules, which are very much geared towards um, assessment for reporting. And um, the latest course does talk about screening for everybody, um, diagnostic for those that need intervention, progress monitoring being essential. Because if you're doing intervention and it's not it's not moving, then you need to change your intervention because that that's it's just a waste of everyone's time. And there is that real sense of urgency. And then, um, yeah, lightening the load a bit with assessment for reporting, and I think all the teachers would um, definitely agree with um, agree with that one. Um, is there anything else in there that's a question? Um, gosh, lots of thank yous. Yeah, did anyone else have a question? Let, oh, and in, protecting the intervention, yeah, absolutely. We. Um, you might want to say a little bit more about this, Alice, but we grapple with that idea of students, and I'm not sure what other schools do. Often intervention happens in the afternoon and students come out of other um, classes, but we also know for sometimes our vulnerable learners, PE is the highlight of their week. Art might be the highlight of the week and they're already not loving school. Um, and so to take them out of those things, um, we, we decided to take that they would stay with their class for the first half an hour and then come out of that um, literacy block for intervention. And we made a deliberate decision that, that we would protect every single minute, um, that those children deserve that. And then we would really have a proper measure of whether a program worked or not. Because if you're not implementing it, you know, regularly and really rigorously, you're not really sure whether it's the program that hasn't worked or the implement and Im implementation that hasn't worked. So that's, um, yeah, been a good thing too. Anyone else want to wave with a question? Oh, Ashley's asking about a recording. Um, <laughs> we did record tonight. We did, we're really um, aware that we're not professional presenters and also we were sharing data from our school. So a little bit protective about that. And also a little bit protective about um, sending things um, out into the wider world where people are watching and listening who maybe don't know us and don't know the context of our schools too. Um, so we have recorded it. We'll just um, maybe watch back and make sure we're all okay with everything that's on there. Yeah, on, on there too. You know, our school data is on there and we're, yeah, we're happy to share, but also happy to share with an audience that we know. Um, potentially too. So Kathleen will let you know. Can I ask a question please? Yeah, sure. 
Can I, I noticed a few people talk about um, and I'm noticing, especially now that we're on remote learning and I'm getting work sent in how laboured handwriting is. And I'm just wondering how you're finding that, that program. Hayley, we missed the crucial first bit of your question there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the that, I know, this, this is the issue with remote learning, isn't it? The glitch. Yeah, sorry. About Peggy handwriting. Yeah, yeah, Peggy Lego, I noticed a few people talked about that. Look, we, uh, other people have got other things to offer probably, but um, I certainly came through at a time where we, we didn't think handwriting was as important and we've really learnt now how important that can, those brain connections are and how strongly, how closely linked it is to spelling. Um, not necessarily to reading, but handwriting, there is research that shows that it's very strongly linked to spelling. Um, we, I had read about Peggy Lego and just liked the idea of, six basic movements make every, um, that there'd be other things, you know, that schools could do, probably more just that consistent approach. Um, and Shay just put William Van Cleve, who um, unfortunately passed away, but he's got some amazing, uh, did some amazing PD and well worth, yeah, looking up. But um, I suppose it was just, yeah, I, I'm not necessarily, it's a bit like Sounds Right, you know, which, which we use and love and the writing revolution, but, we're just, there, there are many other options for all of those things. There would be many other handwriting programs. We just did whole school PD for two hours with an OT talking us through why handwriting is important and how, um, you know, it comes from core muscles or all, all of those things, shoulders, how children sit. And um, just that idea that if we, you know, get that automatic, again, it frees up that cognition. The more we understand about cognitive load theory, if we can get handwriting automatic, then kids um, can write for longer periods of time and, um, you know, will hopefully enjoy writing a bit more. And while VCE is still essentially a handwritten, um, you know, experience, we, we, again, we need to send our, our kids into secondary school able to write for extended periods of time. Yeah, so uh, we we have used the Peggy Lego, did the Peggy Lego PD. But. Can I jump in as well there, Susan? Um, yeah. This year, um, I've been doing Peggy Lego as well um, for my year one, two <coughs> class and the prep teachers also using Peggy Lego. And I think the fantastic thing about it is that it uh, can be very physical. So for my guys, we start off with some exercises. They're doing their planks, they're doing their crunches. And so it starts off that, you know, it's a handwriting lesson, but they're getting a sweat up there, building those muscles. And, you know, it's it's more than just sitting at the desk and making sure your pencil grips right. It's, it's um, yeah, getting them stronger. And so it turns into um, a really multi-sensory experience and they love it. Yeah, yeah. There's increasing um, research around the benefits of teaching cursive too, which we're we're just grappling when to do that when you have composite classes. But um, that that really helps our students with letter reversals, and it's just the act of yeah, your, your pencil not leaving the page. Um, wave away anyone else at five fifty. We've gone a bit over time, but I think everyone's very happy to talk about something other than case numbers and. Um, yeah, if anyone else had a question. Um, no one else? Me. I actually found last night, so I was looking for some um, benchmark deco for decodable text and did notice, and I thought everyone might like to know, that little learners love literacy at the moment, have all of their decodable texts for free until halfway through September. But when I got onto their website, they've also got some really good decodable benchmark testing. And I just- Okay, yeah. Had yep. a good look at them yesterday and thought, actually, yeah. they're yeah. really good for before you're doing other testing with kids. Yep. Assessment is a big challenge, I know, for all of us. It's just how do we align what we're, when our teaching changes and doesn't necessarily align so smoothly with what um, the big curriculum outcomes are, particularly at F12, and how to, yeah, um, how to get our assessment right is definitely a big challenge. Um, 
So thank you, everybody. I think everyone it just, yeah, it was just lovely to come together and maybe hear from, again, those three very generous teachers. And it is a big thing to put yourself out there and put your practice out there and share what you're doing, but we really appreciate that. Um, I've got pages of notes and I'd already met everybody and had a chat to them. So um, yeah, there's things, you know, things that we learn and we need to share, talking about, yeah, the reading spine, um, talking about, like you said, um, Laura, the discussion about when you introduce vocab there. Louisa Motes has this saying that teaching reading is rocket science. It is, it, the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. And the more um, we know, the better off our students, you know, will be. That's the really important thing because because our children, that was the whole reason we formed this group. Our children in Ballarat have a right to literacy. And um, yeah, that's, that's what we're all aiming to do. So have a great um, finish to the term. And we've got a, we've potentially got a couple of really good um, sessions coming next term. We thought we might even squeeze into next term while there's a bit of momentum around, I think and lots of keenness, yeah, to sort of connect and learn a bit more. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Shay and Laura and Alice. Big clap.